All right. Welcome everybody to the live entertainment town hall. Uh, my name is Patrick Whalen. I'm with Backstage Productions. And I would like to thank all of you for joining uh, this, this meeting and this, this town hall. Um, this is a very important discussion. Uh, I know that we're all chomping at the bit for answers. And, uh, you know, this is something that we all have been impacted immensely and not in a million years in January 1st of 2020 would we ever think we'd be in this position. This was supposed to be the big touring year and, and all the year, uh, all the tours were going out. And, and I know myself, we're, we're looking to figure out when we could have a day off. So um, we're all in this together. I know that there's been different discussions about being in the same boat and all that, but today we're in the same boat, which is we'd like some answers. We have some ideas. And unfortunately, we're not the ones making the decision, but what we are hoping to do is have enough information to help the people that make those decisions sort of fast forward this, fast track this, if you will. And, you know, I apologize first for not having everybody into the Zoom meeting. We have four or 500, and, and I know the number is growing every minute here, of people that wanted to watch it and, and Zoom just wasn't going to be able to handle it. So we had to keep it uh, a little bit more intimate and then broadcast it live on YouTube. However, if you have a question or if you want to have a comment that you want to have made, please click to the bottom of the YouTube link, click on show more, and there's a jot form where you can submit a question. We'll get it in real time. We will try and get to all the questions. We have a lot of questions that have been submitted prior to uh, the town hall. And so, you know, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna work through them as fast as we can. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping about this. This is an industry meeting. This is a live, inter inter excuse me, entertainment industry meeting. We're not politicians, we're not physicians or anybody in the medical industry. So we will not have answers when it comes back to when are we gonna go back to work? When is this disease and this virus gonna be under control? How is it gonna be treated? We don't have those answers and we won't have those answers today. But what we're going to do is at least have a little bit of an idea of how we're gonna go back to work, what that's gonna look like and some input from a very, very wide variety of people on our panel that all have different uh, information, have had different meetings, and they're gonna bring their knowledge to us. And this is probably gonna be one of the most informative meetings, as I hope, and if it isn't, I apologize in advance, for you guys to feel a little bit more comfortable about where, where we are right now and how it's gonna look when we go back to work. Because the industry as we know it will definitely change and it might be for the better. I don't think it's for the worse. I know that we all want to get back to work right away. I do too. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator and massive supporter, Ray Waddell from Polestar Magazine and Oakview. Ray, welcome. Thank you. And, uh, and Ray is going to be uh, also helping on answering some of the questions uh, that you guys have. I'd also like to introduce my panel uh, and Please bear with me here. I'm going to read this off the sheet. We've got uh, Jake Berry, Stuart Ross, Jim Digby, Alex Hodges, Adam Cornfield, David Norman, 5'1", we probably all know him, Lori Delancey, Doug Roundtree, Mike Downing, Misty Roberts, Dana Frank, Anthony Bonavita, thank you, and... Steve Adlin and Tim Roberts. RJ Lynn is also behind the scenes. So we're gonna jump right in. Um, and our first really, uh, I guess, hit was we were all caught off guard. We were on the road and the current situation was kind of unknown. There was a lot of cities that weren't sure if they were ready to go and, and do a quarantine. There were a lot of people that were doing shows and I'd like to talk about really quick for just a minute to our panel, how are you guys affected and at what point did you guys start coming off the road or, or realizing that this was a much more serious um, uh, issue than we'd all really thought? And, and, and before we start there, I'd like to say one thing. This was a subject that got brought up over and over and over at Polestar uh, in February. And 
everybody's attitude at that point in time was, it's not here, we're fine, I'm still gonna go to China, I'm still gonna go to Japan, I'm still gonna travel to Europe. And I remember this panel discussion after panel discussion, this came up as, it's not here, it's, it, it, this won't be a big deal. And here we are, three months later, shocked. <laughs> So uh, I push it to you guys as the panel. What do you think, or when, when you were on the road, where were you guys, or if you were on the road, or, or you were prepping for a tour or advance, when did you realize that things were not going to be as easy as we think? Jim? Well, for me, oh, go ahead, Jim. Oh, no, Ray, go ahead. Well, I would say for me, uh, we did feel it a little bit at the, at the end, uh, as far as Polestar goes, Polestar Live, the conference, normally those last couple of days are, are huge. And it just, it didn't have the same pattern as before. So that made me sense some, some weariness. But where I office, uh, when I, there, it's an entertainment coach company. And to see over the course of two days, 60 buses come rolling in the uh, parking lot in two days, uh, that was a pretty clear indicator that, we're not in Kansas anymore. I mean, it was like this. It was one of the saddest things you could see, and a real clear indicator of how uh, how life was not normal, and uh, there's going to be a world of pain coming. Yep. Um, so let's start up talking about the getting back to work and the perspective timeline, and and when and how we see shows return, the safety protocols. How will the advance and the production process be different? And, and what do you think or what is currently being developed? And, and we can do these one by one. And I'm really going to look at uh, Jake Berry to start that discussion of the perspective timeline of when and how you see shows returning and, and what you would think is going to be different. Well, first of all, I wish I had a crystal ball to give you that answer because I think that's the great unknown. As we know, uh, Germany and then the rest of Europe will follow. I've banned all shows to the end of August, you know, and I would imagine, I feel that America is probably a couple of weeks behind what's really going on. So that looks to August. I know for a fact in my world, and uh, I work a lot for Insomniac and we do EDC Vegas, and we have that plan for the first week of October. Now, there's some people who said, you know, it's okay. I, I believe it's 50-50, to be perfectly honest. I mean, you can't go from zero people to 150,000 people overnight. Um, so when they're coming back, I don't know. I mean, we'd all like them to come back as soon as possible, but we all don't want them to come back if it means coming back is too soon and it creates the second wave, then we're out longer. That would be an even bigger disaster. So I'm afraid that we've, had to, we've got to listen to you know, medical staff a little bit and respective uh, governors of states and, 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 and country leaders, you know, so it's like that. And of course, when we come back, as you rightly said, Patrick, it's going to be a whole new landscape. I mean, sadly, we're going to be missing some people. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, the people who have passed away in the industry is not as great as it could have been, but we're going to miss some people that way. But also people that have had no work and probably found alternative jobs, companies that couldn't survive this, and it's the battle of the fittest. And um, what's happening now is we have no control over it. We have no control what's going on. But I do believe all of us here, you know, whatever we do, whether we're agents, whether production managers, tour managers, vendors, uh, bus, bus companies, whatever, we have to think to the future and what we can do to reassure the public that we're doing everything possible to make their experience, you know, as good as it can be. We have to win their confidence. We have to win the public's confidence. And also, we we want to make it safe as well as professionals, you know. We're just as susceptible to, you know, catching this virus as loading in the production as people coming to watch. So all our new safety measures, um, we can go into them forever, you know. 
it starts when you load the show in with your crew. First of all, I believe that everybody's going to, for the first thing, is going to have gloves and masks. That's going to be an absolute necessity. And as production people and promoters and whatever, and building managers and, and agents, we've got to insist on that to our local stage hands. And as Tim will rightly point out, this is going to be just as important as a high to hard hat, a high business safety shoes. Wow. Okay. Next, everybody's going to have their temp need to have their temperature taken before they go into the venue. Whether you are a worker or whether you're, <coughs> excuse me, whether you're, you know, an audience member. So, you know, we're going to have the guideline now. You know, all of us here can remember 20 years ago, you went to a door, you showed your ticket, you walked in, and you got in. And as the years have gone on with security measures, we've gone from, um, you know, walking in with a ticket to a ticket scan. I mean, the early days when you ripped the ticket up, put in a bucket, and somebody backstage counted to make sure nobody was cheating. That's all there was. So, so now, you know, you've got the safety scan, the scanners, and then you're going to have to have your temperature taken. And if it's, well, I know it's Europe, it's 36 to 37 Celsius of temperature. If you're 38, you're going to be asked to step to one side, go to a quarantine area and say, I'm sorry, you can't come in, but we will test you in two hours. That's the things we got to be looking to the future. And building, building people here, you know, their, their staff are going to have to wear either the splatter shields, I think, or masks when they're serving food and beverage wow. and merchandise, and even when you're taking tickets. It's a whole new world. So, I mean, I think we all agree on that. I think we're all... 100% agreement and production you know we got to be as safe and more and safer as we were before I mean we all have to learn and we all have to learn a new way yeah Stuart I, I kind of would like to to hear your perspective on this as well because uh you know I, I know that your your concerns are are probably equal and with Jake's but I also would like to hear what you have to say about just the future of what this is going to look like uh, you're muted, Stuart. Obviously, I agree with everything Jake had to say. My question here is, let's say we predict that late August is going to be safe to have shows. At what point are we going to put those shows on sale, which I'm going to guess, and I can, you know, ask Alex and Adam this, late May, are people really going to feel comfortable buying tickets in late May? That's you know, this is, this is all very complicated stuff because, you know, first, it has to be legal for us to open venues. And in my mind, we're going to follow the sports model. Whatever they end up doing, we're going to end up doing. You know, however, at what point are my touring colleagues on this panel uh, comfortable with putting 10 to 12 people in a bus? One person gets sick, everybody gets sick. And if it's a band bus, your tour's over. So yes, we're all guessing and everything's gonna change. But, you know, there, there has to be a period of time when the general public is willing to buy tickets to shows. We don't pivot that quickly. We pivot quickly in production, but we don't pivot that quickly in ticket sales. If the AMC on the corner opens up for movies, they will have an audience night number one. We need time to yep. be able to put this together. And, you know, we're also going to be limited to what the... Um, what the general public, what the patrons, uh, their their uh, tolerance for an unknown risk is. Sure. Jim Digby, uh, from a, a safety point, and, you know, I, I know that the Inter Event Safety Alliance has been working on this diligently of sort of kind of outlining um, protocols. What is, what are, what are you guys working on and what are your concerns coming back. I mean, obviously, Jim, you and I have had discussions prior to this uh, town hall meeting and, you know, the, the, the safety of the, the crew, the safety of the artists comes up over and over again. And then also the safety of the patrons that attend all of these events. 
um, maybe you could give a little insight on what you guys have been working on and, and um, talk about some ideas that have been tossed around. Thanks, uh, Patrick. May, maybe I start with you know, the blatant recognition that we represent a business that is squarely in the headlights of contagion. Uh, we've, we've survived over these years because the kinds of contagions that we are susceptible to and um, that propagate as a result of mass gatherings have not been, have not had catastrophic end results. Coronavirus yields a potential different outcome. And there are some countries whose rollout plan for going back to normal is based on square meterage of a particular storefront and the amount of people who can be in that storefront at any given time. I suspect that uh, the, uh, none of us can say with certainty, but I suspect that as we move forward in time, one of the first things we might see is sporting events with no audiences. Well, that doesn't do live music much good. Um, We'll see the small uh, strawberry festival type shows come to life first where the capacities are limited or early on, I don't wanna say first, but certainly early on. And that, and that our, we have to build both audience confidence and operational confidence from where we are today in incremental steps in a sort of Kaizen way, one small step at a time to large scale events. We're not starting with stadium shows. I'm fairly confident to say that. Uh, and, and if along the way we trip up or an event is the thing that causes uh, massive numbers of people to get ill, then we're likely going to be set back to ground zero again, right back to the beginning. So it, it stops us completely. Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's really imperative and incumbent on all of us to work synergistically as kind of one model to how we protect ourselves, protect the industry, protect the audience, so that we don't have that mistake at the strawberry festival size, or at the first wedding that comes back, or at the first conference that happens. None of those entertainment categorized things can be the place where a mass contagion outbreak is able to be pointed back to that moment in time. So like the ESA's uh, origin story, and, and as has been the case, as we've had these new events unfold, the Bataclan, Las Vegas, um, stage collapses, we're pivoting now to study what's the best procedures and protocols for us to apply to the industry as it comes back in incremental steps. Because the, the strawberry festival producers are, are not Jake, for instance. You know, Jake's got a good idea of what has to happen. Many of these other events are happening for very thin margins with, with carnies. And, and we are at the mercy of them doing it right. So I'm going to let Steve speak to where the ESA is now with respect to that guidance and how soon we can expect it and how much more help we want from the rest of the industry to make sure that we all agree on those guidances. Uh, Steve Edelman, you're, you're chairing the group that is uh, constructing these guidances, right? Uh, yes. So thanks, Jim. <clears throat> um, I'll be very brief about this since I'm sort of stepping out of turn. The Event Safety Alliance is currently working on guidance for reopening. The guidance is intentionally written to be scalable. And, you know, with all due respect to the people on this on this conference, most of you guys won't be able to use it very soon. Um, we fully anticipate that the venues, the events that are gonna get to reopen first will be smaller. Um, that will be as a matter of law, handed down from governors or municipal officials, at least in the United States and Canada. And so we've intentionally written this to be scalable, starting with the smallest, the ones with, as Jim correctly points out, the least margin, the least education about safety and security at events, we're going to give them some pretty basic guidance and a framework for them to make decisions that are reasonable under their circumstances, which are probably going to be kind of different than what Jake is familiar with or, or Jim or Stuart or any of us because they have fewer resources, but they also have smaller scale problems. So 
the thing that's essential is to get them information at a time when they can use it. So the last thing that I'll say about that is the time when we're going to have guidance pushed out, we are aiming for Monday, May 11. Um, and we've intentionally oh, wow. set that date to have written guidance pushed out to the world, Monday, May 11, because we think based on what we've heard from public officials throughout the U.S., that's probably about the time when some places that have had relatively few reported incidents of coronavirus, those places are going to start to be given permission to reopen. And we want to have written guidance ready to go, ready to push out to the world so that people who are allowed to reopen have at least some clue how to reopen safely. Well, you know, and, and, I'd like to talk to, to Tim Roberts really quick about how things we're, we're talking right now about the U S but Tim, you know, overseas, what, what's been the discussion there about going back to work and, and how that's going to look and how that's going to operate uh, going forward. Yeah, I'm dialing in from the UK. So my perspective is, uh, is kind of different to you guys, but we work globally. So have feelers out around the world. Um, whilst I applaud everything that Steve was just saying, I think May 11th is um, exceedingly optimistic, uh, particularly given that the US is probably a matter of weeks or possibly even a month or two uh, behind the European curve of infection. Um, uh, and I think uh, the point that both I think Stuart and Jake made early about, you know, uh, and Jim indeed, you know, let's not, our desperation to get back into business shouldn't allow us to make a, a kind of crazy decision to come out early and start redoing stuff when we get a second wave of infection because uh, that would be uh, catastrophic in terms of uh, human cost um so you know we're looking here in the uk uh until at least the end of uh, june and i think uh you know we're probably looking to be honest i think we've probably lost most of the summer and we just need to not suck it up in the sense that we can brush this aside because this is kind of you know massively important people losing their livelihoods people going through immense trauma and difficulty and i, I get it but if we were to come out back too soon then all of the pain we've endured till now would be for nothing and we'd have to do it all over again so realistically i think we've got to look at a longer timeline um and you know looking at my virtual background here which is my we office, missed that <laughs> And then, uh, this is my office. Um, you know, we can't we can't redo a show like this if it's dependent on everybody self isolating and keeping a meter or two away from everyone else, waiting on a hundred thousand kids to get their masks ready before they come out of their tents. It's not going to work like that. It can't be reliant on that. And what we have to wait for is for the virus to be sufficiently dissipated through the community that we are not at risk of mass infection, or we've got to wait for the vaccine to come on stream. I think anything else is a false dawn, uh, and we should be, you know, duly skeptical of that. We've got to do the right thing and not the quick thing. Um, and sometimes it's very hard to do the right thing, but we're the folks who should be advocating doing the right thing. Yeah, I 100% agree. And, and, and for clarity, Tim, uh, Steve was pointing to uh, some of the governors in the US suggesting that it might be that early. And the date for May 11th was actually related to when we hope to have a, an extremely accelerated version of this guidance through a process, which would include as many as, as many eyes on as we can get. We're following the American National Standards Institute um, at an extreme, well, there are types of protocols at an extremely accelerated rate to get there, to be in front of anyone allowing an event to happen. Sure. Uh, um I'd like to to also bring this qu same question to Mike Downing and and you know Mike from a safety and security perspective. I mean this this has got to be uh, a, quite an uphill battle for you just to even start to to plan and think of what the new protocol and what the new world is going to look like. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where you've been uh, or what kind of meetings you've been having and what what kind of information has come out of those? Mute, Mike. <laughs> Mike, are you there? Nope. There we go. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Back with you. 
just as after 9-11, as, as there were many paradigm shifts uh, with, in perspectives with regard to national security, partnerships, information sharing, smart practices, ultimately leading to the Safety Act, which many of you know, the leagues have, the arenas have, uh, corporations have to provide indemnification against a lawsuits should there be a terrorist attack. Likewise, the pandemic is having many paradigm shifts, culturally uh, changes to operational practices, the shifting of security protocols in favor of modifications and accommodations with regard to health and sanitation, you know, creating low touch, no touch environments, uh, much faster uh, lines, screening, queuing, uh, the idea of branded masks for everybody, of course, thermal screening and what that looks like, and deciphering the snake oil from the from the real uh, capabilities that actually work, uh, to back to facial recognition and clear type of capabilities uh, for ticketless entry and authentication. Uh, no bag policies completely now, I think we're gonna see. Um, touchless payment uh, platforms, you know, anything we can do that. And then, then there's also, this came up, which is interesting. I don't know where I really sit on this, but will there be an appetite for pandemic protections with smart practices similar to what we've done in the Safety Act arena, as Safety Act was, you know, provided protections against terrorism. Uh, will there be this for that? And what is the litigation aspect of of this if you don't, you know, take on these different standards? So really, it's about the priorities, about the proper standard of care for the employees, the staff, and it's been said many times in this in this conference the idea of what do we do to build the confidence back? Because that's the real measure of success is, are we gonna have enough uh, standards in place, technology in place, practices in place to give confidence for the patrons to want to come back? Um, and I think that, you know, we still have a lot of, I think there's a lot of survey work to do. I also think there's a lot of health journey mapping to do to, to, to really understand what this is about. And, you know, I come from a city, I'm, I'm based in Los Angeles. Our mayor uh, made a public statement that there will be no live events or mass gatherings for the re remainder of the year. So we're really struggling with, uh, with, with this, understanding what the ramifications will be. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm going to, uh, to our panelists, I'm going to go off a uh, uh, run of show here for a second and, and ask a couple of questions. I, I think... There's a couple of things. One, the I never thought in a million years, other than uh, EDM concerts, we'd be seeing face masks for sale in the merch booth. But I think that's where we're headed. So it, there you go. There's an idea. But the the second thing is, I, I, we, I think we're 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 going to have almost spot touring because, as Jim said, th there are there are people, the younger bands, the the younger festivals that they're dependent on making that money. For so so waiting till 2021, maybe necessarily, even though it's the smartest thing to do, is not an option. And and one of the things that I know that we're concerned as an industry is the first person that goes out and does it and they fail at it sets us back 10 more steps. And so from and and, and from a, a venue standpoint, you know, do you see that that people are going to try and do something just because they, they want to be the first or they have to be the first. And is there a way that they'll be safely able to pull it off? Or, or do you think if, if it's just, you know, I mean, masks and gloves are just not going to cut it and we, we still have to wait. I mean, and I know that um, there's all kinds of talks about how this virus is going to work. We're not going to touch on that today about seasonality and all that. I don't want to get into that. But what I do want to get into is, do we see somebody going out and doing this and trying to be responsible? And, and if they're doing it that way and it fails, how far does that push us back? And I'll direct that really to, to everybody uh, and opening it up. Um, and, and in the last, in the second thing is uh, a second part of this is, do we see as our industry, something called spot touring that I just made up now, meaning that we can't go to LA 
we probably won't be able to go to New York, but the Midwest and the South may say, yeah, we're ready. Come do an event. I mean, you know, you, you watch the TV right now and, and there's some, some difference of opinions of, of what's, what's legally being able to restrain. And as that gets challenged more and more, my concern is, is that there's going to be those states that pop up that start doing events and there's going to be bands and agents and managers and promoters that are going to start strategically routing open market areas and avoiding LA. And I just wanted to get your comments on if, if you think that will be a thing or if you think that that's not even going to be in the cards and it, everybody's going to just kind of wait and see. That's a, a good question for Adam or Alex. Yeah. Alex? Yeah, I'll, let me jump in uh, and unless Adam wants to, to go first. Um, you know, go when uh, Jake Berry uh, coughed, I wait for... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a part of the uh I think that's a part of the environment that we're all a little sensitive. Um I think the smaller we work mostly now in Needleland the concerts in the smaller venues from call it uh a little over a thousand to five thousand in most of California and we're certainly uh, can't help but notice the comments from the governor and the mayor of Los Angeles. When we, back to the first question of when, we were hopeful to open, uh, you know, um, a new show at the, uh, at the Pantages in Los Angeles from the Broadway division uh, in, in, uh, in, in March. And it had loaded in, but we were quick to learn that you know, that couldn't happen, so even opening night. Um, I think everybody, the comments about the uh, robust touring that we were experiencing was already evident in small venues for the year and seemed to be evident in the festival and the arena business, and now it's come to a, to a halt. Um, in that we operate in small venues, for example, the City National Globe in Anaheim. I think it's going to be more manageable for us in that in that realm. One of the assets there is the use of portable seating or flat floor for general admission or uh, banquet style uh, events. So we have a tremendous amount of flexibility. In that the venue can actually hold 2000 i think we can work with the city to bring you know in shows that are call it from a thousand to 1500 rather effectively and safely and all the things that were mentioned uh, you know michael and others about mask and gloves and temperature i think will have to be implemented and when you just go back not that far and think about the day before metal detectors everywhere, it seemed an impossibility to deal with it from a consumer point of view and a and traffic point of view. And everybody's adjusted. And then in theaters, the use of dogs uh, is, a, is a fairly recent phenomenon and everyone adjusted. Um, so if we can also, in the larger venues, go to clear bags, that's an adjustment. And now it's mask and gloves and temperature check. I think the temperature check can be relatively easy, and, and Michael and others can answer that, but you, you see certain airports where you can they, they check your temperature as you virtually as you're walking. So I think these are the new norms, and... Um, then it's a question of will will the consumers be be uh, confident and feel safe. We recently put a very small show up that uh, the management wanted us to, and just a pre-sale didn't spend any money, and so fifty percent more in tickets on the pre-sale than four years ago. Same show. If it had gone to zero or two or eight or 12 tickets, you know, I mean, just or any reduction, I think that would have been a signal. Um, there's a lot of interest in refunds, obviously, uh, when the public doesn't know. But we're seeing 
we're not seeing a, um, a stampede in the smaller venues like that. So I think there's a lot of confidence in people wanting to go, willing to go, and waiting for that signal. But then the government rule will, will dictate, and if and if you know, if we can't get, have, you know, gatherings, ticketed gatherings in California at all in 2020, you know, that'll be 90 percent of our concert business out here, um, and for summer venues, it'll be 100 yeah. percent. So, you know, there it needs to be a balance if it can be pulled off successfully. And I think um, whether you're talking strawberry festivals or the small indoor venues, I think correctly, those may be, you know, the first to open and the first to be tested. I think it's going to be a tremendous job to be responsible and do it right. Yep. Yeah. Adam, I'd like to, to hear your uh, your input on this with the, the touring side and just what your artists are have been talking with you about. Well, obviously, everybody is eager to get back on the road as soon as possible. But as soon as possible is clearly uh, going to be a long time because of consumer confidence. Because where I believe that major concerts, major shows, along with major sporting events, are really going to be the last in line when it comes to things returning to normal. Uh, Everyone from getting your hair cut to going to a doctor's office to going to a restaurant to kids going back to school, all these other, getting on an airplane, all these other things are going to be worked out before we have major mass gatherings, in my opinion. Um, and for that reason, I believe it's going to be a long time uh, until that happens. Um, I don't see spotty touring. I don't see touring in certain parts of the country because bands and their crews come from all over the world. Um, and it, it kind of, it doesn't really make any sense to, to tour certain states. It, it makes no sense for a lot of reasons. But, um, but I really believe that we're going to be last in line, that um, concert Adam, and major sporting Adam, events will be the last. I mean, are we in a place where fortune sort of favors the nimble? So you've got bands that can, make a living and never get out of texas you've got uh you've got bands that have a crew of six and uh one bus uh those sorts of and there's i mean la in new york is not fargo is not uh amarillo right so for the a band band that, production it takes it takes a long time to get this stuff together and if someone said oh uh texas is going to be open but the states around it won't be, you know, three months from now. So let's go play Dallas, Houston, you know, and whatever. Uh, by the time those three months came, five there would have been five changes between now and then. Um, that's never going to work to just pick a state. I really don't believe that. I think it'll have to be the whole country. It'll have to be all opened up because by then there'll be consumer confidence and the flow and everyone, everyday life will be returning more back to normal. And that will include going to concerts and major sporting events. Got it. Well, and, and that's actually gonna segue into my, my next topic, Before which is- Before you do, let me, let me weigh back okay. in. Sure. Um, I, I think that some artists can gear up and go if a venue is open quicker and wherever they live, if they lived in Nashville or if they lived in Atlanta, if they lived in, in wherever, they are shorter routings that could be done and it's been experienced by a lot of low production fans over you know a lifetime uh, so i think i think there are some bands that could take advantage of different states and regional markets opening um it, it would still be it will seem unusual uh and i would definitely hope any effort to open up would be national and would be include California because that you know where we were. Yes. Uh, for the employment of a lot of people out here in Joima. But the, the the idea that you just that it would absolutely require national opening and I and I hope we would get that. Um, if you have a band that 
that's in the Midwest or the Southeast, I think they would, um, you know, welcome opportunities to go out and do a weekend or do, uh, you know, eight out of 10. So there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of unknown. Sure. Um, and before we jump to the next subject, I, I'd like to to sort of have uh, Jake or offer Jake Stewart and Jim to sort of wrap that the, this segment up, and then we'll jump to the next one. If you have anything to add, if not, we'll we'll jump on to the next one. Just one thing, you know, when our industry comes to start off, there has been some tours that's already preset for some venues that you know the tickets are still available. It could just change in the date. Production companies have got the shows together. So in theory, if you is a, a few tours, just a few, could start off in three weeks because everything's ready. You prep it, the signs of the prep, their videos prep, the crew's anxious to go. And if the venue's open, and I agree with Alex and I agree with them with Adam. It's all or nothing for touring, I think. You know, you got a tour is a tour, and it, it also depends on Europe. You know, you got acts that are going to run out of venues to play in America that need to go to Europe. So we got to work as a world. It's not America, it's the world. And, and there's something I see is you take islands like New Zealand, it's quite conceivable that those markets will could open up first because they have more control on the people coming into the country and the more people localized because they've done an amazing job. Uh, so, and you, you know, and Alex Allen, they have bands that do flyaways. So they pick up a guitar and they pick up crew and they have six people and they could go and play with local sound, local lights, local video and set up and they could do an island first. Yes, but now to do that, you have to quarantine for 14 days before the first show. I, yes, I mean, after the fact. I mean, I don't mean when it's quarantine when they open up the quarantine restrictions go away. I'm sorry, I didn't clarify that, but I agree with you, Adam. All right. Um, let's jump on to the next one because I want to keep this moving. Um, we, we sort of touched based on how future productions are going to look. And, you know, the, the NFL, the MLB, the NBA, and, uh, you know, some of the other sporting events, even, you know, some of the racing events are now playing to – empty arenas, empty venues, limited seating. I know UFC had talked about briefly having an island that they were going to rent, that they were going to have all their people quarantined and do the fights. And obviously some people got involved and turned that down. But do you see in the short term, and, and I guess the short term could mean 2020 for uh, lack of a better word, is that do you see artists doing the pay-per-view you know, renting a soundstage and, and doing a concert there, or do you see it being more of a residency or, or are we going to wait and, and do touring and, and do smaller venues, but more multiple dates per city? Kind of what, how does that, what is that going to look like in the future for us? I mean, are, are we going to readjust and stay away from stadiums and, and arenas from the get go, or are we going to try and jump in? And then I'll, I'll, Jake, I'll go back to you and then we'll go back to Alex. You're muted, Jake. That's space bar. Um, I think we'll all agree that we can't play to empty arenas like sports is able to. First of all, I think sports is, for, is a people's sport, and I think playing it behind closed doors would just be greed going for the TV money, personally. I think it's a spect all a spectator sport. So, yep. you know, there's rumors that they would play all the baseball season in Arizona. I mean, what a... I mean, can you imagine that? That'd be crazy. Um, whew, I mean, there's so many moving parts here. Um, I, I, think, I, I, think, I think we all have to be patient. I think we've got to sit back and we've got to wait and we've got to, we've got to take all the ideas that everybody's given you know, and wait. On the production side, when it comes back to touring, you know, that, that depends on a lot of other things. It depends on... Um, you know, artist fees, ticket prices, and can the artists who had a big production planned before it goes out, it's all talk that when everybody goes back out that everything will have to be reduced. I mean, that's the word on the street, that artist fees will go down, ticket prices will go down, and then therefore, if, the, if you want to keep the same differential in profits, your production's got to go down. And that's where you get into, you know, to 
other things like, you know, the Misty and people like that? Or do they see a design in shows for the future? Is it smaller? Has it got to be more cost effective? Or, you know, for the, for the foreseeable future, I'm sure in 18 months we'll be back to where we were in 19, I, I would think, 18 months to two years. So I think there's a whole new landscape. I think shows could possibly get smaller. Yeah. A Alex, I'd like you to, to jump in on that. I, I know you, uh, you had a comment about widespread panic. Well, I, I think they created last year, maybe had one of their biggest years of a non-touring model and just taking uh, dates of uh, two, you know, two gigs in a city. And, you know, Ray may know something about it. Or you, Buck Williams isn't on the, on the uh, uh, panel, but he, he really has had great success in a non-touring model. Now, what's required for that to work is the venue to be open, confidence with fans, uh, and their ability to be flexible and nimble. And I think one of the things Jake just mentioned is, is reducing production elements, somehow the elements of flexibility and, and, uh, and, and size are going to apply uh, from production to capacity. So I, I think... Uh, if we if we do see models that are, are an information rolling out in early May, and there can be uh, live events, you know, following July or August or September, that 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 will mean a lot to people. And I think also the economics of it is, if that were to happen, things have preceded it that will be of economic value. The economic machine right now is at a halt with the exception of, you know, deliveries and, and essential business. Uh, so if things happen where other businesses open up, that will help along with unemployment checks to put some money in the pocket. Not everybody goes to every show. So I think if you, if you look at the consumer, some of the models would we have our post our meetings and other people say, you know, a person goes to two and a half concerts a year. Um, and I know you don't go to a half a concert. Yeah, but, absolutely. <laughs> but what the, about some people go to six or seven and it's a part of their lifestyle. Uh, but there'll be some choices made to pick shows that people want to see and venues and what's affordable. I think another comment made about our ticket price is gonna to have to uh, be creatively uh, reduced without wholesale going to free because that flies in, flies in the face of uh, trying to maximize capacity when we're sure. trying to somewhat yeah. streamline capacity. Alex, I'm gonna jump over to Dina uh, from First Avenue. Dina, with, with you know the current situation, how are things, being planned or what kind of changes are you guys going to implement or what do you, what have you been working on? I know Minneapolis is, is one that is talking about reopening sooner than later. Is that go the same for the clubs as well? Yeah. I mean, I think we're really fortunate in Minnesota to have um, a really unbelievable governor in Tim Walls who led the state and uh, put measures into place really early. Um, and I tend to agree with Alex that, I do think there are some smaller bands or club bands that are going to be able to do like regional tours and, you know, maybe 10, 12 dates, something like that. Um, because un unfortunately, you know, none, you know, we're not making money, but our artists aren't making money. And so there's going to have to come a time when, you know, we do what we can to, to try to get some revenue and to try to get some uh, to money in, in people's pockets. Um, so. Um, sorry, I might lost track of the original question, but what are we doing? We're, we're staying up to date with the CDC. I mean, I think from First Avenue's perspective, you know, we're, we want to do what we can for public health. And this, this is a public health crisis. And so we'll do whatever we can to keep people safe and follow the instructions as we're given. And, you know, I think Patrick, like you said at the beginning, we're not doctors. I, you know, I don't know how to protect people, but there are people who do, and we're looking to them and we're taking direction from them. And, trying to be as prepared as we can for when we do get those instructions. So I definitely took down the May 11th date 
Um, and I'm going to be following <laughs> up with you to see how we can best like coordinate. Um, and so uh, that that's what really what we're doing is we're just we're taking the lead from the experts and, and we're going to do everything we can. I also uh, agree that um, opening prematurely is probably the very worst thing we could do as an industry. I mean, one, you know, you open back up, there's an illness at a concert and then our whole industry is screwed for decades, if not just two years. So uh, we're definitely of the mind to be more cautious and just, you know, just because somebody nationally might say open the door i mean we're we're gonna take extreme precaution so l- let me ask a question if if minneapolis releases the stay-at-home orders is is first avenue is going to try and and start getting people in the club as soon as possible or are you guys going to wait or what what's what's that future look like for you guys are you are you going to try and be more cautious and stay closed or i mean we're we're a ga club and so you know, we can't put plexiglass 12 feet around people and try to cordon it off. And I can't, as a business owner, guarantee that, you know, kids won't rush the stage and be on top of each other, even if we do have some kind of like limited capacity. I mean, from my, again, I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I, we're taking our lead from the experts on this, but like, at least from my perspective on, you know, April 20th, I can't see how we can protect our customers and try to assure any kind of social distancing. I mean, even with like, we have a thousand cap fully seated theater. I think even there in line for the bathroom or in line for merch, I, I don't know how we guarantee these kinds of social distance restrictions and certainly a vaccine or uh, herd immunity or again, whatever the experts tell us is the long-term solution. That's what we're looking for. Understand. Anthony, when do you have some holes in place and what is your optimism about how we might have an arena show? Well, I I, uh, I would say that um, I want to be as optimistic as possible, uh, but I do agree with Adam that there's a, you know it's going to be a while before we see you know full board uh, up again. I think uh, like everyone, we're trying to adapt and adjust to to the, the every day that that the news uh, comes out and trying to be res- responsible. Uh, but getting this right is more important than getting it done. Right? We have to get it right. Uh, just here in Ohio today, uh, there is a race car track that the owner came out and said he doesn't care. He's going to race. Doesn't matter um, what 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 Ohio does. And and for us, that that really puts us back if 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 something happens there. And and I'm talking about for industry wide. And the, the one positive I would say that or one of the positives that's come out of this is we're all in this together. Really means we're all in this together. I have collaborated and talked with more of you over the last month than I've ever had in the 25 years I've been in the business. And, and I think that's, that's an important piece because we're all in this together now trying to figure it out. We'll, we'll go back to competing um, at some point down the road, but right now we're all collectively trying to figure out, I want Dana's club to open up. So then my, you know, my venue, my arena can open up, but the same principles apply. I mean, whether it's a thousand people or 20,000 people, they still have to be protected the same way, not to mention our team members. And so for us, uh, Ray, to answer your question in a very long-winded way, I felt like that was a Steve Edelman answer to a question. But um, you know, really, what we're trying to do is is understand what the the, the step is next week. Start figuring out what our state is going to do. And when our state opens up May first, what does that mean? It doesn't mean we can rush the stage at, at Dana's Club. It means we have to open up, uh, you know, more essential businesses, whether it be you know doctors' offices or chiropractic centers and things like that. But there's going to be a cadence to this that we have to pay attention to. And then one of the restrictions, of, you know, also the experience of our team members, you know, gloves and masks, they're going to be the norm. We just have to, we have to figure out what that looks like and how we can effectively achieve it. It's not what we can want to do. And I think there was a snake oil salesman uh, statement earlier. I think Mike said it was that that's what we're trying to understand too, is what do we really need to do and what is going to be sustainable moving forward? So to answer your question, I think it's going to be a while. Uh, we're very hopeful for the fall. Uh, of this year um, to get back operating. Um, but I would not be surprised if it would be a, a little bit beyond that. Yeah. And, and it's the, I, I'd like to ask Misty and uh, David 5-1, uh, this question is, you know, from day one, going back out on the road, what are your concerns and how do you think you're going to, to, to run your tours differently? Or what do you think will be, you know, sort of, the first day for you guys? And I will start with Misty first. 
I mean, from a, a tour manager standpoint, my, my first and main concern is how I'm going to travel my band and my crew. Um, I, I think we said it at the very beginning of the call, sticking 12 people in a bus, you know, it's terrifying. It's, it's a breaking terrifying. ground already. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, you know, everybody has their, Oh, we need to set the temperature at 60 degrees so that we all stay well. And it, that doesn't work either. So in the midst of, you know, a pandemic like this, the there's, there's just really not a way to keep people away from each other in the way that we've previously traveled. You know, if it's not buses, then it's plane travel and plane, you know, airplanes are also a germ breeding ground. So, um, you know, that's the first thing that's on my mind right now is how I'm going to get people from point A to point B and, you know, giant arena tours that have a hundred people traveling, you know, I mean, statistics are going to tell you that they're going to be people that get sick. Well, and, 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 and I want to just add one other thing. The, the hotels, not only, I mean, the hotel, I've stayed in some hotels that have not been cleaned and I'm terrified of that. So not only do, if you, if you dodge the bullet on the tour bus and then you dodge the bullet on the airplane, you still got to stay in the hotel, which, you know, hopefully has been sanitized to, you know, to, to everybody's specifications and to, you know, safety. So yeah, I, I, I can appreciate that. Well, and I mean, it just, it just goes further and further, you know, like you can follow that domino effect because if you make it through the tour bus or the plane, you get to the hotel, you make it through that. What about the runner van? What about your dressing room? You know, it's. What about or, the shower? Yeah. I don't, I don't even want to like, <laughs> whenever this happens, I'm never showering in a venue again, ever. Um, I mean, it's literally, like I said, it's just a giant domino effect and I just don't at this point see until there's a, a vaccine or something to that effect, a way to actually travel. Um, that's why I, I'm, my personal opinion is that residencies are going to become a, a huge factor in our business. Um, yeah, and, people don't have to move. And let's, let's jump over to uh five one and, What's what you know? Speaking of residencies, I mean, do you see that becoming an, a new norm for you? Oh, go ahead, Adam. No, no, I just I just wanted to throw out because I'm I'm listening to everyone talk and and it's a lot of great ideas here and stuff. But the truth is is that we're talking about moving back into the house, but it's still on fire. Yeah, like it's too early to it's too early to move back in. I mean, the fire is a, a little under control maybe today than it was yesterday. But the fire's still on, so we can't move back in yet. And we're talking, we're talking about, oh, maybe we'll have a big show, a small show. Maybe we'll have to change ticket prices. Maybe we'll have to change security. Maybe, maybe some of these, maybe. But the house is still on fire. So a lot of this seems premature. I think that's why I believe that we're unfortunately, um, you know, a ways off from, lar from large social gatherings. Uh, again, be it music or sports. Sorry. <laughs> no. Uh, David, five one. Let's. What are your uh, your thoughts on listening to all this and and where we go from here? Well, I'm thinking also from a standpoint. It's man, this has got so much stuff going on in my head right now. But I'm also thinking of like when we're traveling to other countries. You know, when we're checking with our crews. Hey, do you have anything on your record to show that you can't travel into this particular company country? Are we going to have the same thing that we're going to need to put into effect of, hey, have you had the virus in the past two months, three months? Are we going to have to start insurance wise when we're advancing these tours and things? Or is this going to be another thing that we're going to need to talk to promoters and the agents about is insurance? You know, what if we have a show that goes down of people coming and, you know, one person gets sick? You know, we're going to have that domino effect of, okay, we have to shut this show down. So, but to get back to your original question, I do think that we might have to further down the road, look into residencies and, you know, once we start, we have to do it a little bit slower with residencies, you know, maybe having like they're doing on airlines now, you know, a seat between each person that's at a particular show 
Also, I see that going back to what Jake said earlier, you know, with our productions being smaller, we might have to do multiple nights in a particular city at a particular venue to go back to what Misty said to, so we don't have a whole gob of our own traveling people moving, you know, night after night after night, which will kind of cut down hopefully a little bit on some of us contracting it. But I think in the long run, we need to do what's right in the long run, even if, and God forbid, you know, we don't go out this year, you know, it's better to do something in advance that's going to help us and we're going to pay for it on the back end where we're going to be able to really start moving yeah. into the real world. I, I want to champion back to what uh, Jim and I think a lot of people have said, which is if, if we go out too soon and this thing fails, we're going to be back to square one and this is going to take twice as long. And then just to even get the insurance companies to start underwriting any of this and, and, and the artist to go back out knowing what happened uh, is going to be tough. And, and Lori, I wanted to jump over to you and, and get your input on, on what we've been talking about so far and, and, and what your thoughts are on, on, you know, residencies versus touring and, and, and how we're going to move everybody around in, in the future. So I think residencies, I agree with what was said that um, we may see a lot of those in the future. Um, as far as moving about the country, I, I took some time to speak to some travel agents and some of the hotel reps, you know, that work in entertainment travel specifically. And there's a lot being done with the airlines right now, as far as fumigation, as far as putting space between, you know, seating of passengers. But once we start talking about moving as a group, none of that has been worked out yet. Um, the hotels all seem to recognize that we as a group are going to be looking for some sort of information as to how they are deep cleaning, whether it's UV, whether it is uh, some sort of a fumigation process. Uh, they are looking to find out what needs to be done, what their staff can do, such as housekeeping, whether their housekeepers need to be trained, whether certain services need to come in. So it does seem like they are recognizing that we're going to be looking for changes to happen to feel more safe once we get to that hotel phase. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I hope that we're all in those phases sooner than later. But I, I think, you know, one of the things I want to keep reiterating is, uh, you know, the, the goal of this town hall meeting is to have a discussion with all of us as an industry. I think that the, the biggest problem is, is that, you know, we're, we're not going to have answers that everybody wants. And I know that people on the, on the YouTube channel and, and the general public want answers of when. And once again, we don't control the when. We just can control the ideas. We can demonstrate that we actually have the ability to put together a cohesive plan that might be of use to people that are in our government, that might be used to our state uh, and federal uh, officials to help us get back to work. But by no means was this ever intended to be, we're going to give you def definitive answers today. You're going to walk away and you're going to know the date you're going to go to work. And I just want to reiterate that um, because I appreciate everybody's input, but you know, w there's a lot of information to go here. And, and, you know, as we go forward, um, you know, please understand that this was, a group gathering for all of us so that we could all have a lot of different people and a lot of different disciplines come together as one group. And, 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 and that's all I wanted to say. I just, a, a little, another little housekeeping tip. I want to jump into Patrick? the, yes. Patrick. Hey, I, I just want to um, go back to uh, what David and um, others said, which is about insurance. Yep, and um, I'm probably going to lean on Steve Edelman for this, but quite frankly, I don't think we're ever going to be able to cover infectious diseases in no. uh, cancellation insurance any longer. And if we can, it will be so expensive that nobody will want to take it. So I think we pretty much have to take um, insurance relief off the table from here on out. Maybe I'm wrong. Happened once before. Um, 
Stuart, I, I would love to say, oh, you're definitely going to be wrong. But I mean, this conversation is not only, you know, making everyone's head explode, but it's raising all sorts of insurance and legal issues for which, you know, I, the lawyer, say, please, God, consult with your insurance people and your whoever does your legal work, because this is a minefield. And if you think that you know how something is going to work legally or or insurance, wait a day and the answer is going to change. So, I mean, anything we know today is probably going to be wrong in a day or so. And, you know, the usual ways that we can transfer risks through insurance or contract, yeah, we're going to be charting currently uncharted waters. I mean, think about it. Uh, everything you know, just change and change and change again. Well, let yep. me ask this, uh, Doug, is there an appetite to get on a tour bus and are people making inquiries? And if we got a green light, would people, would these buses be leaving out and people getting on them and going to shows? Well, I mean, when you say there's an appetite, it's a funny question. I'm sure right now people are probably kind of paranoid, wouldn't they? But, you know, what we pride ourselves in is us. We've always operated safety here, but I've never had to think about safety from so said, Doug, we're losing you, I think, a little bit. Not too many hours on the road. Okay. Am I here? Um, could be a bad internet connection. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Okay. Um, but anyway, um, it, so we were, we're, having to, we're going to have to retrain our drivers completely. Instead of just being about safety, we're going to have to now protect against the virus. I mean, we do temperature checks when they're getting on the bus. Uh, what's our cleaning protocols? That's all changed for us, clearly. And then we're going to have to institute a lot. So before we ever row, we're going to have to put some know who's, you know, new standards in place with the whole <coughs> driver team. We have to have some additional training take place. And do we outfit every bus with the ability to take temperature of every band member that gets on? I would think yes at this point. And so, uh, but uh, to answer your question, Ray, is there demand? Yeah, I mean, we've got all kinds of uh, tour managers that's got holds on buses, but to me, it's just a light hold until I see it happen. I don't know. I mean, it's um, we we're booked for the fall, but it's just all relative as to what goes. You know, I, and I would agree with what everybody said on the panel. I think it'll be the smaller clubs first, and the smaller venues, and the and the smaller acts, and and it'll scale from there. But um, that's how we're addressing it at this point. Hey, Doug, I'm going to guess that. Um you're probably going to have more bus holds rather than less because the smart play, if there is a smart play, would be not putting 12 people in a bus any longer. Putting six right. in a bus now, you know, then you have an economics issue, but we got all sorts of issues to figure out. Right. Right. And and I would say you're right with that. And, and, and you know, we acknowledge that and know that that's happening. So it's just... Uh, but I, I think that we can, uh, I think that we have an opportunity to improve what we're doing here. And I think we have an opportunity to provide as safe as environment as we can. Just like you talked about planes fumigating. Well, we could do the same thing with the bus, except it's, we could control a much smaller crowd than what you control on a plane. A plane you still got, I don't know, two or 300 people. Yeah. We could have six or eight. So I like our chances of being able to control the environment to a degree. Now, I don't know what the person goes into the club and brings back to the bus. I mean, all that's unknown isn't it yeah but i do like our chances of being able to create an environment that is a safe environment well hopefully we're on one of your buses sooner than later Could I um, up on so I, i'd like to jump over on before we get to the questions just on some venue uh questions here and it's i'm going to direct it to uh, uh dana alex and um and mike first and then have the rest of you guys jump in do you think that general admission seating, as we know it, is going to be a thing of the past, or do you think that that's going to be something where we're still going to have to work around it? And, and I mean, you know, think of the festivals and think about, you know, the, the, there's already, you know, a lot of the, the outdoor amphitheaters have seating. They do have sometimes some GA, but as far as festivals go and, and clubs, is the is there going to be a GA anymore, or is there going to have to be some sort of structured, you know, aisle system or or something? And and what have you know what have you guys talked about? Um, 
And then obviously, you know, on the security side, I would imagine that meet and greets are a thing of the past. I would imagine that the way that the merchandise uh, people and, and tour staff and the and concession staff uh, work together, that's all going to change and interact. So, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to, you know, have it uh, jump into there and then we'll go to uh, Anthony as well. So um, Dana, I'll have you start. I mean, I don't think I heard anything past like, is GA going to be a thing of the past? And like my whole world just kind of like went blank. Like I certainly hope not. Um, mm. That is like a seminal part of the, the music going experience, at least, you know, especially in my world, like of, of clubs. And, um, you know, I'm here also on behalf of the a new coalition. We just started the National Independent Venue. Uh, association which has almost 700 you know clubs smaller size theaters etc across the country like uh, to, to think of that experience you know not being available to to music lovers and concert goers you know i i don't think we can let that happen I mean, so, if, so I if, <laughs> the the past, then, then the metro is going to be a thing of the past grand central station is a thing of the past walking on the sidewalk has to be a thing of the past uh, i completely agree with dana and you know Looking again at my office, you know, it can't be, no, we can't do that anymore. What it is, it's unsafe to do this right now, but hopefully if we wait long enough and the virus is dissipated in the population, we can go back to doing what we did. So Mike? I don't, my yes. simple answer I think is no, it can't be. Mike? Yeah, I think from what I've talked to the, the different leagues and venues about is we're gonna see a fragile partial slow burn back to operations where they are talking about modification of seats, modification of courtside seating, um, the, the separation of populations, maybe different populations at different times come into the venue, different kinds of queuing lines. So I think, I think you're right. In the beginning, that's what we'll see. Hopefully we'll be able to evolve past that, but that's what they're thinking about right now is how to modify that to have physical distancing within a venue. Yeah, uh, Stuart, I, I wanna jump over to you. I, I know you have a comment from somebody uh, viewing this and and I, I would like to hear from, from that comment. I have a, an, uh, a listener wrote in, a Mr. Uh, Charles Hernandez, Minneapolis, Minnesota. As the last few weeks unfolded, we as a world community are now faced with something that none of us have ever been through before. More specifically, right now, with the absence of any public gatherings, the impact on our lives as touring professionals and the reality of food insecurity is, of course, very concerning. Couldn't I'm, have said it better. I don't have an answer, but he's right. Yep. Yep. And I, I'm going to direct the, the next question to Jim uh, Digby on uh, upscaling and, and, and also I'm going to add Misty into that. And if you guys could kind of expand while we have our, our downtime, uh, unfortunately, that nobody, none of us want, um, what are your recommendations? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to hijack it for one minute because I think it plays into what Charlie's, what Charlie's getting into the conversation, which is wholly important. Yeah. possibly the most important thing at the moment. It's it's clear we all agree life as we knew it is nowhere close uh, in time. And it's also abundantly clear that there are people who work in and around our tribe who are sleeping in their cars right now. And that since we're conscious, we're not running buses any day, anytime soon, and we're not putting venues to work anytime soon, Perhaps we should be thinking about how we shift our efforts to uplift and take care of those who support us when we come into venues. I don't have a miracle answer for that, but I do know that it's it's not just food, it's it's not just money insecurity and gig insecurity, it is food insecurity. And in Charlie's estimation, we're there. And there are numbers of people who work around us or depend on shows to feed themselves and their family. And we're in dire straits outside of, outside of our homes at this point in time. So 
I don't know what we say about that other than we've got to find ways to contribute to the food banks. We've got to find ways to contribute to looking after those that we can, that we can reach outside and touch. And as Charlie would say, go down to the bottom of your driveway, look left and look right and find somebody you can help. Um, in addition to that, it's fairly clear that this can cause a, a, a mental resilience concern. And it's also fairly clear that this time, I'll let Misty speak to the mental resilience, but during this time, if you're not working and you have access to the internet, it's a good idea perhaps to upskill. There are hundreds of programs available, if not thousands online right now, where you can go learn new things and increase your trade craft. Not the, not the least of which is the event safety, tra safety training, the basic training there. So don't just sit around and wait for tomorrow to come. Use this time to improve your skills because the market, because it's gonna start slow, is not gonna be hiring everybody all at once. So might be a good idea to get at the top of your game, at the top of that pool of people who wanna be hired by doing everything you can to, to professionally develop. And Misty, what, are, what is it that you've seen out there that people are doing? What are you doing? I'm getting a, a Harvard degree right now from home for free. Um, <laughs> I am, I'm taking two classes uh, at Harvard. I'm taking a class on improving your business through a culture of health and the humanitarian response to conflict and disaster. Wow. I'm also taking a class on the science of well-being at Yale because they're free. And I've got nothing but time to sit here and figure out what I can do to make me more valuable when those lights come back on. Um, obviously, Jim and I also, um, you know, we started a mental resilience webinar every Friday um, because man, this, this takes the wind out of your sails, you know, I, I, and I, I got to listen to the one uh, about addicting. It was, it was fantastic. So yeah. um, um, thank you. When, when your stability disappears, your, your sense of mental well-being can go right along with it. So Jim and I both kind of very quickly when this happened, you know, I've been a, a very strong, um, voice on mental health out on the road for a while now. And I instantly threw myself into making sure that everybody out there knows that they've got somewhere to go. Um, this is, you know, not to say that a lot of roadies don't have families, but there are a lot of roadies that are solitary people when they go home and fighting this alone is overwhelming to some. So, um, you know, Jim and I, we've got a couple of uh, experts, actual therapists that come on every week. And we have guest therapists that come on every week and we have a, a different theme to talk about. Um, we've talked about asking for help. We've talked about the shame, the grief cycle. We've talked about sobriety because um, that's also a giant battle out there right now. Yeah. And we're, we're going to run um, you, your uh, website information and your schedule at the end of this yeah. Um, and it'll also be broadcast. I, I know we're, we're, we're right now we're about an hour and 18 minutes into it. And I know that, uh, everybody, you guys have all been emailing a ton of questions in, and I know Ray has been sort of sifting through them and organizing them. Um, so I'm going to let Ray take over for right now. Cause I know, uh, we, we not only want, do you want to hear, uh, our voices, but we want to hear your voices as well. So Ray, if if you're ready, do you want to jump into the questions and then uh, you can direct them to the group uh, for answers? You bet. Well, there were a lot of really good questions and uh, we appreciate you sending them in. Uh, a lot of them. So I'll combine a couple. Uh, one of them is about the the deals. A lot of these questions are unanswerable, unanswerable uh, but let's talk about deals and, uh, and, and bookings. One, if say we do open up, people will be lining up uh, for a veil. So the economy, how much can they support? We don't know. Uh, but uh, one, how do you prioritize, say they're overlapping dates? How will you prioritize in that time frame of the ramp up? And uh, that would be to uh, Dana and Anthony or any other venue that 
wants to speak up, and the other would be for Alex and Adam. How do you uh, say you get a day? How do you make a deal when you, especially now, when you don't know capacity, you don't know uh, what the uh, what the demand is or what the capacity what the capacity will be uh, as far as uh, social distancing in this new era. So first with the veils, how do you prioritize the avail? And when you book and confirm, say we do start up, Dana or Anthony? Hey, um, yeah, I think overcrowding the fall is a, a major concern. I mean, I think it's on everyone's mind. You know, how do you not totally overwhelm uh, our customers, um, especially not knowing what kind of economy we're going to come out of this in. I mean, if it stays at 20, 25, 30% unemployment, I mean, you know, the last, the last thing anyone would want is to come out with seven to 10 nights on, in a show at, you know, increased prices because now our cleaning uh, costs are so much higher. And so as far as just avails, you know, it's a true, you know, we would just go through the whole system. Um, but uh, I think having the whole industry, having conversations like this and having the industry talking and working together to figure this out is a, a great first step. Anthony, what about you? You've got a lot of people uh, conceivably wanting uh, uh, their show in a compacted time frame. In the best case, can, if we can start, uh, what would you, how would you prioritize? So, I mean, what we're trying to do right now is obviously we have great partnerships uh, with all of, all, of, all of you and, and obviously the promoters. And so we have a number of shows on the books already uh, that we're trying to rejuggle and, and restructure into our schedule. Um, like everything, it's, a, it's an unbelievable um, you know, puzzle right now because we still have a, you know, a potential basketball season that needs to finish and you know, hockey season needs to finish. And, you know, so right now we're, we're working on the shows that we have on the books in, in the next number of months and trying to get them re restructured into our fall and, and spring calendars. Um, and we're, we're not, you know, I mean, we'll take the avails, but by priority standpoint, we're working with the shows we have currently out there. Um, and, you know, everybody's got to be nimble. I mean, everybody's got to be adaptable. Uh, we don't, none of us have a crystal ball as to when and how this is all going to go out. And I think, you know, for, for the most part, it, 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 promoters also know that as well is that this is just going to be an exercise in, in adapting and adjusting and evaluating and adapting and adjusting and evaluating again uh, it's just going to continue to evolve and adam and and or alex how do you make a deal when you don't know capacity you don't know <laughs> uh, what the market will sus sustain and uh, you, you don't know if people are, are going to come well, that's hard because you don't know the new costs, you don't know the refunds, and you don't know the capacity. So what do you, what do you got? You got to work, and I think we are with agents right now working with good faith to just, first of all, get a new day out of, um, you know, like two-thirds of an hour a year was already booked, and we've moved, um, you know, half of the ones that have already booked. The, the good or bad news is is 30 plus dates have moved in uh, out of California and, and one night a row have moved into uh, 2021 already and of another 40 or 50 dates moving in still in 2020 uh, some of them have moved twice so the element the the deal making is just you got to hope that in good faith that we'll be able to figure that out when we go back on the sale. <clears throat> we see the, um, you know, robust sales or just the opposite <clears throat> or somewhere in between and, and work on what are the new costs, what are the new sales and, 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 and try to make a deal. I think right now what we're experiencing is a good faith element uh, while we truly try to pinpoint date, move and get a firm Date. And if we dealt with moving, you know, over 70 dates and some more than once, that means there's 70 tours because our dates are pretty much one nighters coming out of tours. So, you know, another agent um, told me he's moved one whole tour three times and could be moving it again. The interesting thing when we read the, the 
political or the governmental comments in, in California is that we still have an abundance of shows in the last half of the year on the books. And if we aren't going to have any shows at all on the books, then they're all going to have to move to 2021. Sure. Probably what we do, we've only seen 10 absolute cancellations of tours. And they will be rebooked in 2021. Uh, but it's just a lot of moving pieces. And, and the deal-making process, is, that's going to have to be a good faith element working together to reduce some costs and figure out the, uh, the, the ticketing revenue, uh, the ability of consumers to pay the original face price or a reduced price. I mean, we've all worked with various discounting mechanisms before. Uh, so I think with I think we've adjusted to that over different periods of time, including the Great Recession uh, period. Uh, and now we're going to just have to do it again. But it's all it's all new, and the level of unemployment is is pretty much unprecedented. So yeah, uh, and and every every everybody I think is optimistic. We just just not in our control when you can get up and running. But it is in our control to have connectivity with fans, and it is in our control to at least select dates and then an alternative date uh, to, to hold them uh, as well. Well, well said. Uh, I'm gonna before we go to the next question, Ray. I'm gonna jump over to Jim Digby. Uh, I know he's got a comment that he'd like to interject right now. Well, I think it was it was a it was an end of session comment, but I can do it now. I mean, it, it the other thing besides the the actual state of those who help us the the freelancers is that it's quite impressive the way that our uh, industry vendors and our industry thought leaders have stepped up to the plate and created solutions to help the first responders like upstaging and and the other companies who have really come to the table with creating solutions the entertainment yep. industry response group uh, joey gallagher and his his team have have put together over a hundred vendors who are ready to ready to act tomorrow and potentially ready to hire tomorrow too if if in fact they're called on for those reasons and then there's the live events coalition so there's quite a bit of profound thinking around how to help and how to engage right now to bridge the time to being able to put people in venues again no i think that that's a, a great segue into it and, and uh you know, I think we've all been feeling a sense of responsibility and, and, and anxiousness to help. Um, you know, I remember when uh, there was crisis and, and Charlie and Jake and everybody got together and, and you know, have, have helped thousands of people during natural disasters and shipped equipment and supplies all over the world when the military couldn't even do it. I remember that story vividly. Um, it, it just shows the resilience of, of our of our family. So I don't want to take more time of me talking. Let me jump over to to Ray and, and get back to the questions, as I know Ray's got still a nice little stack. And I will say this to our panelists: uh, I, I I appreciate you guys. I know that you've all been uh, kind of hanging in there, and I know it's, it's getting a little bit late. I do want to take uh, a, a go over a little bit on our time. I was trying to end this at an hour and a half. If some of you have to leave, we completely understand, but I would like to, to answer a couple more questions. Let's, let's say two or three more questions from Ray to the panel, and then we'll do our, our closing. And, and um, hopefully we, we have a little bit more understanding about you know where we are today, where we're going. Um, I know it probably doesn't answer a hell of a lot of questions, but at least you know that your family is here to support us, each other, and, and all of us. And I, I appreciate everybody's time. So Ray, I'm gonna jump back over to you. Well, thankfully we have a esteemed panel that has touched on many of these questions, but one of them for, for David or some of the uh, tour managers, I would ask one of the question is, uh, well, freelancers or road personnel, do you foresee a time when they may not be uh, hireable if they don't have the antivirus or haven't had it and recovered? I don't think so. I think that's going to be a tough one. I think Jake, because he's on much larger tours than myself, might be able to answer that one a tad bit better than myself. Um, 
Look, I think it's going to be a concern, but I, I think that everybody's got a lot of common sense. And I think they'll want to look after their individual health. So I think that they'll get it done themselves. So it won't come up on a tour. So I think that's down to the individual. I think it's a good idea. I mean, you know, we don't want to hire sometimes people that have convictions so we can't take them into countries, which makes our life harder. But we value them people and they're good at their jobs. So we take them and we deal with it. I think the same thing will, will, be, that, will be the same. I just want to say one thing. Of all the comments here that we've done in the last hour and a half, I think one of the best comments that I heard was from Adam with the houses on fire. Mm. You can't run into it. So I just want to say I totally agree with him. I think that's the best way of putting what we can and can't do. This house is on fire and we can't go in until it's out. And it was the best comment I've heard on the whole thing. So hats off to you there. And I just want to say one thing more about um, helping our local people. A lot of our stagehands we know are living from gig to gig. Uh, there's a lady here in Phoenix named Maria Bruna who does a thing called Musically Fed. We got together with her and what we've done locally in Phoenix. So we can't work internationally. You have to take your own individual area. So we're going to put together something on Friday and an invite to the 30 most needy local stagehands. And we're going to hand out some food for them and their families. You can do it locally. I mean, all these people that raise money for funds, as you know, we you brought up about the aid relief to Haiti. The reason the road crews got it done is because we don't have to go through fucking red tape or bullshit to get it done. We just get it done. And that's what, well, you know, whether we're in the museum is we get it done. We don't live a normal life. We go to a furniture store, but we don't understand we have to wait eight weeks for a couch. <laughs> you know? We want it now. And, and, and so when we go to act, we will act in a responsible way, but we'll be faster than everybody else. I, I, I couldn't it. agree more. Ray, do you want to jump into our next question? Yeah, this one uh, comes from the performing arts sector where apparently they are talking about allowing refunds on ticket purchases until 24 hours prior to an event. Would the concert industry ever consider a policy like this, knowing that uh, scalpers, resellers would benefit from it and promoters may end up with empty seats? Uh, to do this would be to uh, bolster consumer confidence in purchasing tickets. I'm Everybody's confused. jumping out for that. I'm, co I'm completely confused. On, on, All right, 24 on hours. Re uh, no, uh, allowing refunds on ticket purchases until 20. Don't we do that already? If, uh, no, we don't. We, we don't generally allow refunds at all if a show plays and you bought a ticket that's your ticket so the question was considering allowing refunds until 24 hours prior to an event to bolster confidence i don't know if we'll see that i don't see it personally well let's move on to the uh, next question ray uh, again, moving large tours into smaller venues, uh, scale back uh, at multiple nights to minimize costs while maximizing profits. Adam, would that be something that you're considering for an act, basically a uh, underplay? No. In one so word, gonna, no. Can you be more vague about that? I believe <laughs> it is the hope of my artists that they'll be able to put on the show that they want to put on and the venue that they are that they should be playing, be it a theater, an arena, or a stadium, um, it's just a question of when. I don't see I don't see some I don't see stadium acts all of a sudden playing uh, week long runs in theaters. That makes no sense to me. Okay, here's a good one, and it would be a uh, a good wrapping question before uh, before Patrick. I mean, an hour and a half, that's a long panel, but uh, this one comes from the management sector. And I would say the question is, what is the first thing that needs to happen, needs to change before events are allowed to happen again? And I would say excluding permission uh, from uh, CDC or the local government. Anyone? 
What would it take for you to, to do a show? In the absence of anyone else jumping in, um, you know, I think you have to consider what you said first, the, the permissions. And, you know, the house is on fire and we don't have permission. The fire department working on it. At one point, we will have permission. And then you, it's a matter of training and supplies. You've really got to, I think, be very careful of all the things that were mentioned about the hotel industry and any and any other industry and the buses. You've got to be sure that, you know, the cleanliness, the uh, antiseptic means, uh, and I think the training in terms of ushers and doorkeepers and, and uh, uh, box office people, I think training is going to be more acute uh and, and it won't be that hard to do but you're really going to have to train people if you spread people out more it'll be an unfamiliar territory for ushers so it's a matter of it's a matter of preparedness and that's not going to happen overnight it can happen rapidly because i think uh we we in our industry can move on a dime and pivot very quickly and we're flexible uh, certainly not like uh, a government, but we will have to make a number of adjustments toward the taking the temperature, toward uh, enforcement of masks, uh, until until the life is 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 different. So I think attentiveness and uh, and training are going to be are going to be critical. Well, you know, and, and I think. Life as we know it has changed drastically, and, and uh, you know it's the new norm is going to be the safety equipment. It is going to be somewhat distancing. I don't know if it's going to be the six foot or, or whatever, but I, I think that you know one takeaway from today is what we knew before March first has gone out the window, and, and now we're all trying to figure out what is going to happen after March second uh, of this year. We're really when when this thing started developing more and more. Um, I'd like to thank everybody and I, I'd like to get some closing remarks and I want to open it up to the group uh, and then I'll, I'll have Ray comment. And, and I apologize to everybody that submitted questions that, that we couldn't get answered. Um, hopefully during our, our panel discussions, we did answer some. Um, and, you know, I would love to hear what, what you guys as, as panelists took away from this today or if you want to add anything else and I, I can't stress it enough uh, thank you again so uh, I'll, I'll whoever wants to start um, please go for it and I'd love to hear your closing remarks hey un unremarkably I'll go first um, I just want to say one thing that it was um, Misty and, and 5-1 brought up and it's all about traveling on buses we're not the only people that travel on buses Every way of life travels on buses. And I can't see cities operating without buses, so I think the crew will go back on buses. We're not the only people that travel to hotels, so I do believe the hotels will be, in the bigger picture, taking care to get all the business back, not just the entertainment. And I do believe that, you know, as, as part of the human race, we will all become more aware of our surroundings and more aware of our responsibilities. Jim Digby? Uh, look, we are where we are right now. The, the, the industry as we knew it is in a state of stasis. That can't change. We don't control whether or not that changes. So as creative as every one of us is, what do we do with what we got? Here's where we are. We know that we can do these things. They may not be as entertaining as being in a room with 10,000 people, but we know we can do them. So let's take the tools that we currently have. Let's find ways to put them to work that get us to the next step. And then from there, we take it to the next step. Let's work with what we've got. How about Lori? So I, I find it very heartening that everybody has a lot of ideas that they're putting together, but nobody is sold on exactly what ha has to happen yet. I think everybody from a financial perspective, of course, wants to get things back on track as fast as possible, but recognizes that, you know, if we try too soon, it all goes in, in the opposite direction. One of the things that I struggled with was figuring out what I could do now. 
And for me, my answers came a little late. It took me a little bit of time to figure it out. But for me, Live Events Coalition put out a petition and they've also put out a letter that you can just sign and it gets sent into your representatives. And to me, I think that that's a great starting point of things that people can do now if they haven't already done it. Fantastic. Uh, Live Events Coalition has a national chapter. You can find it on Facebook. Certain cities also have chapters and it's a very simple process that everyone can do. Um, with the letter, there's also an opportunity to create your own narrative so that when you send it to your representatives, you can show them what is happening to you, what is happening to us as an industry. I read an op-ed over the weekend where the person brought up the fact that in Tennessee, home of Nashville, Music City, that the representatives there really did not understand the amount of impact that was hitting the industry and also the self-employed. So I think that that's a great place for people to start out. Oh, that's the other, fantastic. The other thing I wanted to bring up um, is rethinking your business or finding out what your skill set is and how you can repackage that. My husband and I are both in this industry, both lost all money on the uh, 12th of you know March. But we've looked at what our skill sets are and tried to figure out what else we can do in the meantime. Um, and with one of the businesses that I work with, Star Gift Alliance, typically we provide uh, branded items, either swag or we do the VIP programs. And we've started moving over into PPE. We had the connections overseas. How could we start bringing stuff in to keep people safe? So it's just really thinking about what you have in a skill set, the connections that you have, and figuring out what you can do with those, and really getting involved in contacting your legislature and really letting our voices be heard. Uh, that, Lori, that is fantastic advice. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm going to jump over to Stuart Ross. Well, um, the first thing is great to see all of you and anybody who's listening to this, please take care of yourself. Just, just be well. And I, I got a note uh, from Charlie that I'm going to read, which kind of sums up everything for me. We stand together, but for now, six feet apart. <laughs> That's a great one. <laughs> very true. Very, very true. Um, Alex, let's, uh, let's jump over to you. Well, I think it's pretty interesting to recognize how much people who, in this, in this group in particular, behind the scenes uh, are, are so important to music. And it all starts and ends with music. And I think watching the um, music events on Saturday night was really moving. I think everybody probably has your favorite moments. I asked um, my staff what were their favorite moments and and uh, I got a lot of uh, uh, really cool, interesting remarks. I think it was uh, terrific. I remember what my uh, client and friend Stevie Ray Vaughan used to say that music is healing and indeed it is. And I think we need music in every form now. And then what can we do at the, uh, in some of our places where we work, we've started some uh, outreach, like uh, through Instagram, we did a uh, block party and they could order some food that was set up by a local restaurant tour in uh, Anaheim. And we, and we actually, interestingly, we increased our his historic numbers on Instagram by about 30%. So people are hungry for that connectivity and for yeah. encouragement. We had a DJ, and we're going to export that to other uh, venues in California where we, where we work. Um, I think stay well. If you can get outside, do so. Keep your distancing. I walked three miles yesterday. And I had a mask. So <laughs> good for you. All right, uh, Adam. Uh, well, I just like to say that I look forward to uh, elbow bumping everybody at a show real soon. <laughs> elbow. Yes, I do too. <laughs> and David, Mister Five One. I know everyone's hurting really bad right now, but do the things to kind of help yourself mentally and physically getting outside the house and also do those small things 
to the rest of the world, you know, your closest friends, your neighbors, you know, help them out. You know, they might be hurting, you know, Misty said something the other day on the uh, Showmaker Symposium, the mental health one. I said, you know, I just check in periodically with my friends just to say, hey, are you doing okay? Is there anything you need? And I said, you know, to me, that's not a big deal. But Misty says, you know, that's not a big deal to you. It could be a big deal to that particular person that day because they might be going through a really rough time. So check on everyone. And, you know, there's different avenues that are available to us because I've seen that, you know, there's all these different things that are going out, music airs and all these other things that you can check out, but just network, 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 and keep tabs on everyone because we all need it right now. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Doug, um, like I said before, I hope we're on one of your buses soon enough, but uh, sure. closing remarks. Uh, closing remarks. I love Jake. He likes buses and thinks we'll be back on buses someday. <laughs> so uh, I guess one of my favorite theologians, Neil Young, said live music is better. Bumper stickers should be issued. So I'll be glad when live music returns. You know, the uh, it's a time for us to uh, to get better at what we do. It's a time for us as a company here to get better and a time for us to be ready when the doors open. And that's what I intend on doing. Dina, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think the the house is definitely on fire and this could be, I mean, a, a unparalleled crisis. But I think for me, the positive is just seeing how strong the house is. And, you know, I've been watching live streams like hours a day, just trying to like fill this need for live music. And it, it doesn't come close. I mean, I would give anything uh, in order to see a show right now. It's been like uh, emotionally devastating to not have live music in my life. Um, so it's just a matter of, you know, it's going to come back. It's going to come back stronger than ever. It's just a matter of how we do it and making sure we do it right and sustaining our businesses and our employees and our communities and our artists um, in the meantime, uh, getting through. I think uh, from my perspective, especially from Neva and a, a coalition of small business owners with personal guarantees and rents and mortgages, I think federal support is going to be absolutely pivotal. 100%. Um, I don't know how many small, medium, I mean, any business really can go 18, 18 months without revenue. So we're certainly putting a full force effort behind uh, a, federal, a federal support bill. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, live music is eternal and uh, it's a matter of doing it right. Thank you. Tim. Yeah, I just want to take a, <clears throat> a slightly different perspective. These are really dark times, but there are some things that are coming up that are actually very positive. So I've been, I'm the safety guy for shows and for, for live events, the health and safety guy, and quite often just seen as a complete pain in the butt um, and, you know, more or less tolerated, but yeah, do we really need all this? But actually what has happened in the last uh, few months shows that health and safety is really must be at the core of everything we plan and do. It makes me think that uh, we need to reevaluate who are the most important people. Uh, it needs. It means that the maybe the guy who cleans the bathrooms is actually the most important person on the gig and deserves respect, uh, deserves uh, compensation appropriate to that, and and deserves time and the capacity to do their job properly. Um, and maybe we're coming out of this and we go into a realm where people actually care where the crew get to wash their hands. And that, for me, is a very bright uh, silver running to a well very dead. So giving respect to folks whose name isn't in lights on the front of the theatre um, and giving uh, you know, due respect and due regard to the people who genuinely keep us moving and keep us working and keep us fed. They're the ones who are at the heart of this business. And it's not just about the bands. I completely agree with Dana. I need live music in my life and I miss it terribly. But we need to stay healthy. So we're relying on the folks who are pulling minimum wage to clean the bathrooms. And those are the guys who are going to be the heroes for us from here on in. Oh, thank you. And thank you for your time. Uh, Anthony. Well, uh, you know, we, a lot was said about what we don't control, uh, which we, we don't control a lot of this. And so I would just say what we do control is being prepared as much as we can. And there's a lot of planning and preparing that we can try to do now to be prepared when that day comes. Uh, in the meantime, you know, this this has been one of the best collaboration efforts I've seen uh, in a long Thank time you. and, and would, would 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 welcome any further questions or comments to be, you know, and reach out to me directly. And I'm happy to work with whomever and, you know, we can help each other get through this and most importantly, stay hopeful. 
Uh, we'll get through it uh, at some, uh, maybe a couple of days, but we'll get through it. So stay hopeful. Oh, thank you very much. And going over to Misty. Um, I think that for me, one of the most important things to say is make sure that you stay well physically, but also make sure that you stay well mentally, keep your brain working throughout this. Um, there's a million different ways to do that. And know that whatever level that you're on in this industry, if it's you're at a festival person or you're that guy cleaning the bathroom or you're the, you know, top production manager in the world. There are people out there taking you into account right now. That's, that's what we're all here to think about and to really, you know, put some, put some thought into how we can affect everyone all the way, all the way down, all the way up. Um, and we will get through this. You know, but we're an industry of people who overcome insurmountable <laughs> obstacles every single day. This is what we're trained to do. It's, you know, you, you couldn't task a better group of individuals to have to overcome something like this. Yes. Uh, Steve. We've, we've really good collaborative experience here. Um, I'm how to collaborate on well all of us being firefighters and helping to put out our own respective fires go to the event safety alliance it's event safety alliance dot org if you'd like to help contribute to the guidance that we're creating don't control when the starter's whistle is going to blow but we sure can help to control level of preparedness and readiness for when that does happen. Uh, great. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and believe me, the, the readiness and preparedness, we're, we're all looking forward to. And, and last but not least, before I jump over to Ray, uh, Mike. You're on mute, Mike. So, uh, thank you for the experience. I really enjoyed listening to all the disciplines and perspectives. I think what I, I walk away from is when we get to come back to the new normal, hopefully it won't be the usual normal that we've been in, that we take these lessons forward. And this crisis that we are in right now, you know, there's both danger and opportunity. We know what the danger is because we're feeling it today. But you've all talked about what the great opportunity is. And this is preparing us for what we're going to see in the future because this is the pandemic there will be another crisis in four years or five years or six years that we'll have to deal with and partnerships and relationships and collaboration and communication uh, and thinking outside the box and taking care of each other, the duty to care and the proper standard of care for our people, all of our people is, is the, uh, is the number is the number one priority. There's no greater capital than human capital. So I'll just end with that. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to jump over to Ray. Uh, and before I say, uh, have Ray speak, I'd like to thank Ray once again for, uh, I, I came to Ray with this idea about a week ago and he jumped right in, Polestar joined immediately. And I, I can't thank uh, Ray enough for his participation in, in all of Polestar and then also helping put the panel together. Um, you guys all busted your ass at the last minute. You dropped everything to, to be a part of this. So, uh, Ray, um, I'd love to hear your closing remarks as well. And thank you again, Ray. Well, thank you, Patrick. Uh, well, dropping everything today doesn't mean what it meant a couple of months ago, but <laughs> thank you for, for doing this. And uh, I'm, I'm happy and proud to support it. Uh, the beauty of this, and I'll be brief because this is the longest damn panel I've ever been a part of. It. My dog <laughs> needs to pee. But uh, what I'll say is the beauty of this is it's like Jake's dream. You've got the promoter and the agent talking to the production people, which uh, doesn't usually happen unless something goes wrong. So uh, here you go, Jake. It happened. And uh, I, I'm really, to me, that's unusual. And, and I'm very happy to see it. And I appreciate the people who, who joined up. Uh, this this happened, you know, uh, it may be the best time and the worst time. This 
being COVID-19 because the industry has been on a roll of 10 years, having been around it and, and covered it in various ways for uh, not quite as long as Alex, but I'm getting there. Uh, he'll always be a little ahead of me. But uh, one of my first interviews ever, by the way, was Alex Hodges managing Stevie Ray Vaughan. But uh, to, to go back, uh, it happened at the best and possibly worst time because it's never been a better business. You know, it's never been more international. We, we've never engaged the fan like we do now. And we've got scaling better than I think they've had. And so many things are working well. And uh, maybe that means we're better able to sustain and uh, return. It's proven to be a very resilient industry. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, I'm optimistic and people want to go to shows. It's up to us to protect them. And because and, if you put on some people, uh, some artists, people are coming. So let's be sure about it and uh, know what know we're, we're protecting our most precious asset, which is the fan and certainly the artist. Uh, Adam's right. The house is on fire. But, you know, from my opinion, the, the house is on fire, but the, the, the whole neighborhood isn't on fire. And uh, everything's not U2 and Metallica. And there are people that go out with an acoustic guitar and can play somewhere. And it's not all, in my opinion, going to happen at once. This global edict that, okay, the faucet's turning on and everybody can go to a show. I think uh, this this environment, when it happens and when it's safe and when we can guarantee safety, is going to happen. Uh, and it's going to favor, again, the nimble and the people who can pick up a guitar and go entertain without uh, pyro and uh, giant, uh, what is the spinal tap, a 16-inch uh, stone hinge. Maybe they need a 14-inch stone hinge to make their show uh, entertaining. But what I do believe is uh, when it does come back and when the artists are ready to play, guys like you will be ready to present them. And uh, this this industry has a really good moral compass, and they're always the first in line when uh, when some something needs help. Uh, we may be the last in line to start back up, but... Uh, I believe we'll be the first in line with uh, moral and social responsibility and ethics. And uh, I think when it happens, people are ready for live music. I know I am. This is the longest period since I was about 13 that I've gone without seeing a show. So uh, do the math. Uh, we all need uh, our live music. And uh, I know we're all ready to go. And let's hope it's soon. And again, thanks to all of you guys for doing it. And thanks, Patrick, for giving me that call. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I'll just wrap it up by saying that, you know, I, I hope that we all feel a little bit better while we're watching. Um, and, the, you know, the next one that, that happens will be now we're getting back to work and, you know, let's let's get out there. Um, but take care of yourself mentally. You've got a lot of friends. I, I think we had right around 2000 viewers or maybe more. I haven't heard the latest number, um, but uh, that's a lot of people. That's a big family. So if, if for whatever reasons things aren't going your way or you're not feeling well, please, for the love of God, take care of yourself. Reach out to a friend. We, I, we don't want to have anybody die of COVID and we don't want to have anybody go away for other reasons. So um, I, I can't stress that enough because I've talked to a few people that are really down in their luck and they don't feel like there is an end. There is an end. And, and we're all going to be in catering, eating, you know, food with plastic spoons because there's no more forks and, and, and stale bread. So just stand by, hang in there. We love all of you and we look forward to the next one. And I promise the next one will have much better news. Um, and, and to those of you who we didn't get to the questions, we apologize. Literally it was overwhelming response. We thought we'd get four or five. I think we've got 30 or some, uh, some questions and I, I appreciate every single one and all of you. And on behalf of the panel, Thank you so much, and I promise we'll do another one of these again since we have such a great mix of people. Uh, it, it, this is beyond my wildest dreams, so thank you. See you guys, and stay safe. And that will be the end of the meeting.